Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, October 18th, 2024. All right, first thing, a reminder that it is fundraising season at antiwar.com, and we have $40,000 in matching funds, which means if you give now, every dollar you donate will be doubled. And that also means we need to raise the $40,000 to secure those matching funds. So please go to antiwar.com slash donate to help us out. If you read this, if you read antiwar.com, if you watch this show, this is how we do it. If you have the means, please help us out. Uh, we are 100% reliant on our readers for funding. So again, antiwar.com slash donate. Now, the first story we'll go over today is the big news that I'm sure everybody has heard about by now that Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, has been killed inside Gaza. So on Thursday, this came out kind of early in the day, well, early in the day here in the U.S., um, there, there. These reports saying that the Israeli military thinks they killed Sinwar. What's interesting about this is that it looks like it was, it just kind of happened by chance, and that they didn't track him down. He was killed. This is the Israeli story, and they they put out some video, and there's pictures of his body, and it does look a lot like him. They're actually, as I'm recording this on late Thursday night, right before midnight. There has not been an official, as far as I know, confirmation from Hamas, uh, but Israel says they have the body, they did DNA testing, and that they confirmed it, and again, the pictures, it looks a lot like him. Um, so I don't think there's any doubt that he's killed at, that he was killed at this point. But again, w- what's interesting here, according to the Israeli story, what we're seeing in the Israeli media, is that there was a tank crew, an IDF tank crew in Rafa, the southern city in Gaza, and they saw three militants moving around uh, a building or, or near a building. And then they pursued them and they fired on them. They killed two. Sinwar, who they didn't realize was it was even him, he survived the initial strikes. Some ground troops started to go towards the building. He threw grenades at them. Um, and then they flew a drone in to see if he was, you know, where he was. And then they fired another tank shell and they killed him. And they actually released the drone footage of like some of the final moments before his life. And you could see the drone go in the building um, and you see someone sitting in a chair. It looks like part of his arm is blown off. And then he actually throws what looks like a stick or a piece of wood at the drone. Um, And then it was right after this that the Israeli tank shelled him again and killed him. So, I mean, I think releasing this footage was a big mistake for Israel because, you know, the, you talk about a martyr, you know, you talk about a resistance group here, um, and they kill Sinwar, but he's not down hiding in a tunnel. He's out in the open, and he, he fights, you know, to his last breath, really, is what they're showing them here. So I think this goes to show that just killing Sinwar is not going to stop the the resistance from Hamas inside Gaza. Um, and so now... Uh, The U.S. has put out statements, President Biden and Vice President Harris, of course, they, you know, Harris gave a little speech. Um, One thing that they mentioned was that our uh, we've been giving Israel intelligence help. We've been helping them try to track down Sinwar and other top Hamas figures. But again, it looks like they just came across him, which, you know, that's not how you would expect this to go down. Um so now what we're seeing from Biden, Blinken, we saw Austin say this, Harris, they're saying, okay, now is the time, you know, we can negotiate a hostage deal. Um, Netanyahu is saying he settled his account with Sinwar, but the war has not ended yet. Um, so I don't really have much hope. You know, maybe there's a little hope that this could lead to some kind of some negotiations. They could take it as a victory. I think that's what the U.S. is going to kind of nudge for, but they're not going to put any real pressure on Israel as as we've seen over the past year. And I don't think Netanyahu has no intention, you know, with everything happening in Lebanon, I don't think he has any intention of uh, negotiating a ceasefire deal now. I think he's got all this momentum on his side, and he's, he's much more popular 
again inside Israel. Um, so I don't see him deciding to actually pursue negotiations in, in good faith. Um, so we'll see uh, what happens over the next few days. I wonder if this will change the, the thinking when it comes to the attack on Iran. But again, if Netanyahu wants to keep everything going, uh, you know, maybe it might make them even speed up their plans to attack Iran. Um, and uh, Sinwar's killing, you know, because all this stuff we've been talking about, um, there's been these reports in Israeli media that the Israeli government doesn't want to cease fire. That which I mean, we've known, but the reports say basically they're not putting any effort into restarting the ceasefire talks and that they actually want to annex Gaza, which, of course, is not a surprise. But seeing Israeli media actually report that. Um, so we saw all that right before this. So, again, I would be surprised if Netanyahu wants to wind things down now. I think he's just going to keep keep going. Um so we'll see. And I'm sure Friday we'll probably see a statement from Hamas about this. Uh, again, the, the footage is really crazy to see. And the and the pictures of him, like he had a big hole in his head. Uh, it's pretty graphic stuff if you want to go, uh, you know, if, if you go look for it, it is a pretty graphic picture. Uh, all right. So the next one here, the top story, I did things kind of out of order here because we had the Sinwar story up all day. But the top story is really important. Uh, The U.S. will not consider ending military aid to Israel. So Politico reported on Wednesday that the top U.S. official working on the humanitarian situation in Gaza told aid organizations during a meeting in August that the U.S. would not even consider suspending military aid to Israel over its blocking of food and medicine shipments. The official Lisa Grande, who was appointed to the position in April, told over a dozen aid groups that the U.S. could find other ways to pressure Israel, but stressed that the U.S. would not block or delay weapon shipments, which is really the only real leverage that the U.S. has. It's the only thing they could actually do to stop this. Um, But it's really something here. I mean, uh, again, this is back in August, but I mean, the fact that you have this official, so she was appointed to this position, as I said, in April. She's essentially the U.S. official in charge of the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And she's saying that, you know, these aid groups were telling her the deliberate ways Israel was blocking aid. They were telling her all this horrific stuff. And she says, well, frankly, we're not going to stop giving them weapons. So don't even ask us to do that, which is, you know, kind of that's what it sounds like she said here, um, which is kind of a uh, not a surprise, but to, to know that a U.S. official actually just said this outright at this meeting. Um, one aid official who attended the meeting said that Grande described Israel as being in a tight circle of very few allies that the U.S. would not oppose. She said the U.S. would not hold anything back that they want. During the meeting, aid aid officials detailed how Israel was blocking aid shipments and said that by doing so, it was violating international law. Another person who who attended the meeting with Grande said, she was basically saying the rules do not apply to Israel, which again, we know that, but this is a U.S. official actually just said this to all these aid groups and U.S. government agencies had previously concluded Israel was deliberately blocking aid, which violates U.S. foreign assistance laws. But Blinken overrode those concerns to ensure that U.S. weapons continue to flow to Israel. So this comes after the Biden administration sent this letter to Israel, which is so transparently a, a election stunt. They gave them a 30 day deadline to improve the aid situation. Oh, and conveniently, the 30 day deadline ends well after the election, about 10 days after the election. And the letter doesn't actually implicitly threaten to end military aid if they don't fulfill the demands. And the State Department wouldn't even say what the consequences would be. So more evidence here that it's just an empty threat, if it's even a threat at all. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I, th- I think this goes to show that even if you have Biden and Harris and Blinken all saying, oh, now's the time to go for our ceasefire deal, they're not going to actually use the leverage that they could use to make Israel go for a ceasefire deal. Uh, you know, this just not going to happen. All right, so the next one here, Israeli strike on Gaza school kills 28, including five children. 
So Israeli forces targeted another school-turned-shelter for displaced Palestinians in northern Gaza on Thursday, killing 28, including at least five children and wounding 160. The strike targeted the Abu Hussein Elementary School in the Jabalia refugee camp, which has been under total siege for about two weeks. Um, And this is part of Israel's ethnic cleansing plan known as the General's Plan. Um, So Medhat Abbas, a Palestinian health official, told Al Jazeera, quote, There is no water to extinguish the fire. There is nothing. This is a massacre. Civilians and children are being killed, burned under fire, end quote. Israel claimed that it targeted Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters who gathered at the school. Israel typically claims that the schools they target are Hamas command and control centers, but they never actually offer evidence to back up those claims. Hamas denied that it was using this school uh, for military purposes and, and said that the Israel was lying about that. So earlier in the day, Gaza's health ministry released its daily death toll, saying that at least 29 Palestinians were killed and 93 were injured. The latest violence brings the ministry's recorded death toll to 42,438 and the number of wounded to 99,246. And these figures do not account for the Palestinians who are missing under the rubble or uh, indirect deaths caused by the Israeli siege. So the violence, the slaughter continues in Gaza. Um, The next one here, five Israeli soldiers killed in southern Lebanon. This one is from Jason Ditz. Fighting seems to be picking up in southern Lebanon as Israeli forces are reportedly encountering quite a bit of resistance to the ongoing invasion with a substantial battle reported taking place in the Ramia area where at least five Israeli troops were killed and a number of others wounded, three of them seriously so. Um, So early on Thursday, a pair of incidents were reported near Al Labune Hill, which is just across the border. Two Israeli Merkava tanks were hit as they were crossing into the area and were destroyed by Hezbollah anti-tank missiles. Um, so they've taken out a few tanks, I believe, the uh, the, the Hezbollah fighters in the south. Um, so five, Israel confirmed at least five of, it, of their soldiers died in the fighting. All right, so the next one here, Israel dynamites historic Lebanese village of Mahabib, to rubble. So this article is from the New Arab. There's been a lot of video of this going around. Israeli forces wiped out a historic southern Lebanese border village on Wednesday, the first operation of its kind, which has sparked outrage in the country. Videos widely shared online showed a series of massive explosions in Mahabib, supposedly taken by Israeli soldiers from a distance. Pillars of smoke filled the air amid the sounds of loud explosions as Israeli soldiers were heard celebrating as the village was reduced to rubble. So this village, um, it's very close to the blue line. Um, So there's been a lot of fighting here. And uh, located in this village, I'm not sure if this was actually destroyed, but in this area is a 2100-year-old shrine of Prophet Benjamin, the son of Prophet Jacob from the Bible. Um, So a very historic village that they blew up here. Uh, The mayor uh, said that he was still unable to assess the extent of the destruction in the village as a result of the explosion, as a result of the explosions, as locals have been unable to return. But this is something that we're seeing. This is what they've done all over Gaza is these demolitions, you know, planting explosives in buildings and blowing them up, even though, you know, if they're able to plant the explosives, that means that there's no threat to them in that area. So they're just blowing things up to blow things up. In Gaza, obviously, they're trying to destroy everything so they could eventually, you know, bulldoze everything and then build settlements. Um, And that might be some of the thinking here in southern Lebanon as well. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. uses B-2 bombers to bomb Yemen. So the Pentagon said on Wednesday that the U.S. deployed B-2 bombers to strike Houthi targets in Yemen, marking a significant escalation of the U.S. bombing campaign in the country. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said in a statement that the bombers and other U.S. forces targeted, quote, five hardened underground weapons storage locations in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen, end quote. According to the Associated Press, this is the first time that the U.S. has used B-2 bombers in combat since 2017 when they launched uh, strikes against ISIS in Libya. So it's been a long time since they've actually dropped bombs with B-2 bombers. And these are very heavy 
bombers that can fly. I believe these ones flew from Mississippi. They could fly a very long range. The extent of the damage is unclear, and it's also unclear if there are any casualties. Yemeni media reported 15 air raids in the capital Sana'a and in the northern Sada province, but did not provide any other details. The attack was reported as a U.S.-British aggression, but there's no sign that the U.K. was involved. In his statement, Austin made it very clear that this strike was a message to Iran. He said, quote, this was a unique demonstration of the United States' ability to target facilities that our adversaries seek to keep out of reach, no matter how deeply buried, underground, hardened, or fortified, end quote. Uh, he goes on, quote, the employment of U.S. Air Force B-2 Spirit long-range stealth bombers demonstrate U.S. global strike capabilities to action against these targets when necessary, anytime, anywhere, end quote. Very clearly a threat to Iran because Iran's, some of their nuclear facilities, which are civilian nuclear facilities, even the CIA recently admitted that there's no evidence Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon, uh, but some of them have been built deep underground, and they could only be penetrated by the U.S.'s heaviest bunker-busting bombs, which can only be dropped by U.S. heavy bombers. Israel doesn't have these heavy bombers. Israel has the, some of the bunker busters, the 2,000-pound ones, and I think maybe some 5,000-pound ones. But the U.S., and it's not clear what they used here. They definitely use some kind of bunker buster if they're targeting underground facilities. They have one that go, that's up to 30,000 pounds. So that's what they would need to drop on these Iranian facilities. Um, so the Houthis, officially known as Ansar Allah, they issued a statement vowing that the strikes would not stop the attacks they began in response to Israel's genocidal slaughter in Gaza. So the Houthis said, quote, the aggressive airstrikes will not deter Yemen from continuing its support and solidarity with Gaza and Lebanon in confronting the Israeli arrogance backed by the United States, end quote. The U.S. has been bombing Yemen since January, and Israel has launched two rounds of airstrikes on the country, but the attacks have done nothing to deter the Houthis. Um, so the Yemen Data Project, which tracks airstrikes in Yemen, they put out their report, uh, I think, last week on the U.S. strikes, U.S. and Israeli strikes in Yemen in September, and they recorded a total of 15 U.S. and Israeli strikes uh, that resulted in 73 civilian casualties, and that includes killed and wounded. Um, so one of the, the Israeli strikes killed five civilians and injured 57, while strikes reported as a joint U.S.-British attack killed two civilians and wounded nine. The, those two civilians were girls at a school. Uh, if you remember, I wrote the story up at the time. Yemeni media reported that a U.S. airstrike near a girl's school killed two schoolgirls, two children, and that didn't get any attention really from any English language media. Um, but Yemen Data Project, which tracks this stuff, they found that the strike caused a stampede the strike was close to the school. People ran, and two girls were crushed to death because of that. Um, so, again, it's just something that nobody, uh, I, I don't. Th I think very few people are aware of that incident. So, U.S. is bombing Yemen. You know, you wonder if, if this does any real damage to the Houthis or if this is just all about sending that message to Iran. All right, so the next one here, Russia warns Israel not to hit Iran nuclear sites. So on Thursday, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov strongly warned Israel against attacking Iran's nuclear facilities. He said, quote, we have repeatedly warned and continue to warn and caution Israel against even hypothetically considering the possibility of an attack on Iran's nuclear facilities and nuclear infrastructure. This would be a catastrophic development and a complete rejection of the existing postulates in the sphere of nuclear security, end quote. So this warning comes amid anticipation for Israel's uh, attack on Iran. We've been talking about this a lot. There's these reports that the U that Israel told the U.S. they won't hit military sites, but we're not going to know until the attack is launched. If the attack is launched, I think it's still probably going to happen at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, and I just mentioned that stuff. ABC and CNN reported the other day that Netanyahu has approved the targets to hit in Iran, so it could just be a matter of time, and they are expected to hit before the presidential election on November 5th, which is coming up 
pretty quickly. All right, so the next one here, two injured as Israel strikes Syrian port city of Latakia. This article is from Jason Ditz. An overnight Israeli strike was reported in the important Syrian port city of Latakia. Syrian state media and others report that two civilians were injured in the strike near the southeast entrance to the city. It also caused fires and damaged some private property. Israel didn't comment on the strike, and that is typical of Israel. They usually don't comment on strikes in Syria. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights claimed that the raid targeted a weapons depot, but that has not been confirmed. And this, and that's a uh, they're based in the UK. They have sources in Syria, but they're very pro uh, Syrian opposition. Um, Israel has been conducting a growing number of airstrikes across Syria and indeed across the region. Strikes in Latakia are potentially risky because of the proximity to a Russian airbase. So th- these were more strikes that were pretty close to uh a russian airbase so that's always a you know a thing you got to keep an eye on all right so the next one here zelensky says that ukraine needs nato or nukes so zelensky he seems to be really desperate now he said on thursday that ukraine either needs to join nato or obtain nuclear weapons marking the first time since the russian invasion that he's suggested ukraine should get nukes Zelensky made the comments while addressing the EU's European Council in Brussels, saying he made the argument in a recent conversation with former President Donald Trump. Zelensky said, quote, in a, con- in a conversation with Donald Trump, I said, this is our situation. What way out do we have? Either Ukraine will have nuclear weapons, which for us will be a defense, or we'll need to have some sort of alliance besides NATO. But today we know of no other alliance. NATO countries today are not at war. NATO countries are not fighting. In NATO countries, people are still alive. Thank God that is why we choose NATO, not nuclear weapons. And Donald Trump heard me. He said, you have a just argument. Um, so later at the pe- press conference, at a press conference, so he made those comments to the, the European Council, and then he did a, a press conference with the NATO Secretary General and kind of downplayed his comments saying, quote, We never spoke about that we are preparing to create nuclear weapons or something like this, end quote. So in his address to the European Council, Zelensky referenced the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, under which Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan agreed to remove all Soviet nuclear weapons from their territory in exchange for security guarantees from the U.S., the U.K., and Russia. While the nuclear weapons were on Ukraine's territory, they were still under Moscow's control, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Zelensky said, quote, which nuclear states suffered? None except Ukraine. Who gave up their nuclear weapons? All of them. No, only Ukraine. Who is fighting today? Ukraine, end quote. So just a few days before Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 24th, 2022, Zelensky said that he was going to try consultations under the Budapest Memorandum to get concrete security guarantees. Um... He said if that didn't work, then the agreement would be in doubt. And and Russia took these comments as Zelensky threatening to get nuclear weapons. Um, and and that was a, you know, uh, when they invaded, you know, Putin didn't say that, you know, in the list of their justification for invading, it wasn't always included. But I, I remember some Russian officials at the time pointing to that, pointing to Zelensky, suggesting that he might try to get nukes eventually. So him saying this i mean it seems like he's asking for russia to escalate things or something um but and and he's also you know uh, presented his victory plan to some more people while he was in brussels all right so the next one here west bank woman shot in the back by israeli soldiers this article's from middle east eye a 59 year old palestinian woman has been shot dead by israeli forces while attending to her family's olive grove in the village of Fakwa, east of Jenin, in the north of the occupied West Bank. Hanan Abu Salami was shot in the back on Thursday morning as she was picking olives with other members of her family when soldiers stationed on the nearby separation wall opened fire, her son told Middle East Eye. Faris Abu Salami, who was with his mother when she was shot, said the local council had negotiated permission from the Israeli army for the family and other villagers to pick olives on their lands, providing they stayed at least 100 meters from the wall. Abu Salami said, quote, 
We were much further than that from the wall. All of a sudden, they started shooting randomly. We started collecting our things to leave and moved away. My father waved his white hat in the air, hoping they would stop. They shot her in the back as we were fleeing the shooting, end quote. So the Palestinian Red Crescent confirmed that the woman was shot in the back um, and said medical teams had tried to resuscitate her as she was being transferred to the hospital. So this is one of the most dangerous times in the West Bank for Palestinian farmers who have olive groves or, or you know, and it's not just the farmers, it's, you know, their families go to help them harvest the olives that, you know, they hire people to help them. So it's a big part of living in the West Bank is the olive harvesting season. But that's uh, Israeli settlers uh, always attack the, you know, during the harvest times. And this year, uh, it's like they're saying it's the most dangerous year in the West Bank for the olive harvest season. And this isn't settlers. This is the Israeli soldiers just shooting at them while they are picking their olives and they said that they had permission to be there yet they still fired and they killed a woman who was running away shot her in the back this is life under the israeli occupation uh in the west bank and it's just getting worse and worse um you know the situation in gaza is just getting worse and worse west bank for the palestinians is just getting worse and worse there's just no light at the end of the tunnel it seems like for the palestinians in in either territory all right, so the, the last story here, the UK police raid the home of an elect, electronic intifada journalist. So British counterterrorism police, this article is from the electronic intifada. British counterterrorism police on Thursday raided the home and seized several electronic devices belonging to the electronic intifada's associate editor, Asa Winstanley. Approximately 10 officers arrived at Win Stanley's North London home before 6 a.m. and served the journalists with warrants and other papers authorizing them to search his house and vehicles for devices and documents. A letter addressed to Win Stanley from the Counterterrorism Command of the Metropolitan Police Service indicates that the authorities are aware of your profession as a journalist, uh, but say that they're, they were investigating possible offenses under the Terrorism Act of 2006. So this is something we've seen in the UK. Journalists opposing you know western support for what israel's doing and um i know he's done work on the hannibal a lot of work on the hannibal directive um electronic intifada mondo weiss and the gray zone they were like the first outlets to be reporting on that back in i think in october 2023 the the evidence of the hannibal directive being used and and things like that so We've seen this in the UK. They're really cracking down on journalists. Um, Kit Glarenberg from the Gray Zone was, you know, detained not too long ago when he came back to the UK. Um, so it's something that they're just increasingly using to go after uh, journalists. All right, so that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoint. One from Ted Snyder: A pathway from Gaza to a wider war. One from Medea Benjamin and Nicholas J.S. Davies, Israel's War on the World. One from Alan McLeod, Revealed the Israeli Spies Writing America's News. So this is a really good investigation that he did here about Israeli veterans, not just veterans, Israeli intelligence veterans who are writing for American media outlets. And one of them is Barack Ravid who, you know, we use, you see uh, his stuff at Axios all the time. He always has these big scoops. He actually recently won the White House Press Correspondent Award for his excellence in White House coverage. I knew he was in the IDF and he was in the reserves until about a year ago, but I didn't know he was in Unit 8200, which is the their big spying unit. Um, so these are people straight from Israeli intelligence that go on to write news for an American audience. Um, and Ravid is the one who's, he's really been, you know, before October 7th, I mean, I always read his stuff at Axios because he would get real scoops that would, you know, he would report on something and then it would have, you know, it seemed like he had really good sources both in the U S and in Israel. But a lot of times that means that, uh, to get those good sources, um, you know, you to get access, you got to agree to probably report on the stuff that they want. That means that they'll feed you, you know, fake stories as well, too. But if he's, you know, working, he was just in Israeli intelligence. I mean, that's all sort of suspicion on him. And one thing that we've seen over the past year of his reporting really pushing is the narrative that Biden's just been so frustrated with Netanyahu 
that, oh man, if there only there was something Joe Biden could do to stop what's happening in Gaza, but it's all just, uh, you know, he's just so frustrated, you know, really kind of trying to exonerate Biden almost in a way. Um, and that's really a lot of his stories have been uh, about that. So definitely go check out this report from Alan. It's really interesting. Um, all right. Another one from John Weeks, a state made hell. And one from Connor O'Keefe, beware of war hawks in America first clothing. So please go check all that out. Help us out with our fundraiser if you can. This is the last show for the week. Um, if you want to support us in other ways, you could share this show, tell your friends about antiwar.com, like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff helps out. I'll be back in a few days. Thanks for listening.